Hello and welcome to Voices of Freedom, a Bradley Foundation podcast. I'm Rick Graber, President and CEO of the Bradley Foundation. On the podcast, we'll explore issues that affect our freedoms with a focus on free enterprise, free speech, and educational freedom. So let's get started. History reveals important lessons from the past and often provides the context necessary to make informed decisions. It's also the foundation for understanding global and domestic affairs, providing insights in how to achieve stability and advance freedom. Our guest on this episode of Voices of Freedom is Andrew Roberts, a distinguished scholar who brings history to life through his many books and a podcast about statecraft, diplomacy, and world leaders. Andrew's the Roger and Martha Mertz Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, a visiting professor at the War Studies Department at King's College in London, and the Lerman Institute Lecturer at the New York Historical Society. In 2022, and this is really exciting, Andrew was elevated to the UK's House of Lords as Baron Roberts of Belgravia. He's also a 2016 Bradley Prize winner. Andrew, it is wonderful to spend some time with you. Thank you very much indeed. It's very um, kind of you to have me on the show, and thanks for all those kind words. Absolutely. Let's jump right in. Andrew, uh, you're a truly prolific author. You've written 20 books, most or all of which have received high honors and praise from world leaders. You're a subject matter expert on historical figures, on statecraft, leadership, and much, much more. Talk to us a little bit about your process for writing a book. Uh, do you go where your curiosity takes you, or do you have a, a much more methodical approach where you, you, you know, have a pretty good idea what you're going to write about and, and how you'll write it? In other words, well, do you know before you start writing where it's going to go? Um, no, you don't. You shouldn't know certainly where it's going to go, because if so, you're not being led by the evidence. And the key thing of being an historian is, of course, you are led by the evidence you uncover. Um, I don't really know which book I'm going to be writing in five years time. I always know which book I'm going to be writing next, but um, I don't have a sort of grand plan. I always wanted to write biographies of Napoleon and Churchill. But um, beyond that, I didn't really have an idea. And I actually thought I was going to write both of those books in my 70s uh, as the sort of capstone of a writing career. Um, but it was pointed out to me by my publisher and indeed my wife that it would be much more profitable to uh, write both of those <laughs> books whilst I was at the, at the you know, uh, the, the peak of my abilities, at least, uh, but also when um, when they'd be able to get down to selling them. So uh, it wasn't going to be the capstone. It was going to happen midway through my career. And I'm very pleased it did. They were absolutely right. Of course, I, won't, I, I, I should have written both of those when I could. Um, the very process of visiting 53 of Napoleon's 60 battlefields was something that was not, it was much easier to do in my 50s, I think, than it would have been in my 70s uh, for some of them. <laughs> Um, I, uh, other people tend to come up with ideas for my, for my books, um, including a, a gentleman I sat next to at uh, a lunch in Wisconsin a few years ago who came up with the idea for George III, my wife, uh, my parents on one occasion, my publishers, my literary agents, they come up with ideas and, uh, and some of them really work. I, for some reason, have only come up with two, but luckily those were Napoleon and, and <laughs> Churchill, which are the best selling and, and most, um, translated of my uh, of my books so um so i i don't really have a, a process of course i have a process when i sit down and write a history book which is to um put chronology above all i think the reader wants to know what happened next all the way through history people have wanted to know what happened next and i don't believe in thematic history uh, where you suddenly uh go all around somebody's life and you don't put things into context. Context is all, narrative is all, chronology is all. So uh, what I do is to set out a timeline of, if I'm doing an individual, um, a biography, birth to uh, death, and I slot in various thematic um, files into the key moments of the life when and where the uh, reader needs to know it. You shouldn't tell the reader too much too early and uh, obviously you shouldn't um, tell the reader anything too late for the narrative. So uh, so I, I pretty much do the same kind of 
thing for each of my books, but I've no idea what I'm going to be writing in, in sort of um, five or 10 years time. Fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about your current book, Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to, your, to Ukraine, which you co-authored with General David Petraeus. Two-part question. How did that partnership with General Petraeus come about? And secondly, you've studied generals, you've written extensively about generals. What was it like now to, to actually co-author with an actual general? Well, um, it was shortly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine that I got on to David, who I knew pretty well. And I said, look, there are going to be lots of uh, political books and geopolitical books about the invasion of Ukraine. Why don't we write a purely military um, book placing the invasion in its historical context um, as a military operation and also um, having a look at the future of war, telling us what this war is going to tell us about, uh, about wars in the future. Um, because I, we, we both agreed that it was going to be, and as it's turned out to be, um, a, um, a real scene-shifting kind of um, uh, paradigm changing war. And uh, so we got a publisher and uh, the publishers, not unnaturally, said, how are you going to divvy up the chapters? And I said, well, David's going to write about all the countries he's invaded. Um, and I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll do the rest. He also did the Vietnam chapter, which obviously is a tremendously important uh, chapter in the in the whole concept of, um, of the evolution of wars post-1945. Uh, to answer your second part, essentially, what's it like writing with um, with, a, with a general? Uh, well, um, it's the first time I've ever co-authored Generals a book. Generals tend to be strong-willed. And you don't say, you don't say. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, David, you know, he's commanded uh, 160 up to 190,000 men in two, um, in two theatres. Uh, and um, and so you know he's not a man to uh, to take on lightly. The good thing is that he's also an intellectual. He's a soldier um, scholar, really, and uh, he got a PhD at Princeton in international relations. He's written um, he's written a lot, obviously, uh, the, including the Counterinsurgency Manual of two thousand and six. So this is a guy who cares about about thoughts and about ideas and about how they're expressed. And so what we did essentially was to write our own chapters and then send them backwards and forwards in literally thousands of emails um, between each other. So for me, it was a profoundly intellectually stimulating experience because uh -huh. having written about generals in, in Churchill and Napoleon <laughs> and, and any number of history books that I've written, um, actually to to work with one and to be able to sort of get into the into the mindset of one was a um a really useful experience for me i think for future books that i write really interesting again uh, i mean let's let's stay on this theme so whether it's napoleon or churchill or king george the third you're really good at demystifying some of history's leading figures and uh, really debunking misconceptions about them your current book takes a hard look at Vladimir Putin. Did you discover anything about him that runs contrary to public opinion? I don't think that many people know that um, Vladimir Putin is a, he's a historian monkey. Uh, he'd love to have been a historian, I think, if he wasn't a, if he wasn't a dictator. Um, he likes thinking <laughs> about history, talking about history. Uh, he, he wrote just before the invasion of Ukraine, the summer before that, in the uh, July of uh, 2021, he wrote a 6,500 word um, essay entitled On the Historical Unity of the Ukrainian and Russian Peoples, trying to argue essentially that uh, Ukrainian sovereignty didn't exist. It was a, it was a, um, uh, an invention. And um, uh, you know, I, I, I've taught history uh, in the past. I, I taught a semester in uh, Cornell um, a few years ago. That essay would have got a C minus uh, from me. It really was. <laughs> it was. It wasn't up to scratch as a as a history essay. But as a political essay, it was an invaluable mind um, insight into the mind of the dictator because um, on no fewer than seventeen occasions he mentions Lithuania. Um, in this essay. So for me, it's pretty clear that if he were allowed to win in Ukraine, uh, the Baltics might well be next. 
and the Baltics or Moldova. I had a little experience during my time as uh, ambassador to the Czech Republic, uh, dealing from afar with the, the, the Putin regime. As you recall, George Bush was trying to put a missile defense system into Czech Republic and Poland. And, and, and the, the Russian response was organized, effective, uh, and, and ultimately successful in, in killing that idea. Um, American presidents forever have tried to appease Putin, and it never works. And do, do you think they'll ever learn? Um, yes, yes, I think they've. I think they've um, learnt now. I think it's pretty clear to the West that uh, he's an un unappeasable opponent, and that he has to be defeated. But you're right. I mean, we should have learnt that. Certainly, we should have learnt that by 2014, when he annexed um, Crimea and moved into right. the Donbass. You know, that was a um, that was a classic sort of red light um, signal, which uh, which was not picked up effectively in the West. Related question. I mean, you and, and General Petraeus identify lessons that Putin should have learned from the past. What what are those lessons? Oh, well, if you're going to invade Ukraine, you don't do it on five <laughs> axes <laughs> with a force of 100, uh, 160 or so thousand and trying to invade a country of... Um, of uh, 44 million you know that's that's the first pretty obvious um one and uh, and there are many others you know you do need the three to one or so advantage you've got to try to um take advantage of the uh, of surprise which you're not going to get um in the uh, attempt on on kiev you know uh, that enormous long 30 mile or so long armor a convoy that he moved towards Kiev was done right. on one. It was done on one road. Was held up brilliantly by the um, by the artillery fire and the drones of the uh, Ukrainians, and um, and so the absolute um, massive levels of incompetence and neg negligence and corruption and so on that were exhibited by the Russian army, which we go into in some in some um, way, as you say, in chapter nine of this book. Um, do show that uh, Putin had failed to learn a lot of the uh, of the most important military lessons of, of history about the evolution of warfare. Really, do you think he's intimately involved in uh, directing his troops? Um, Does he try to play general? Uh, he, we don't know. Um, he's okay. a um, he's. I would guess from history that he's a bit like um, Stalin. I mean, obviously he's in, like Stalin in, in many ways, but um, I would su suggest that uh, he leaves the actual um, uh, minutiae to the, uh, to the generals, but he keeps a very, very firm hand on the tiller when it comes to overall strategy. Yes. That, would be, that would be my, um, my guess, but, um, uh, but I'm not going to uh, pretend to know anything about the intimate um, details between him and his generals. Yes. How will history view Putin? They'll, they'll think of him as a sort of 18th or 19th century would-be czar um, who was, um, you know, not up to understanding the 21st century military conditions. I think that that's what they'll think. Somebody who wants to make himself another Peter the Great or Catherine the Great or even Ivan the Terrible, but um, actually didn't work out what um, the innate nature of his opponent was like. Whereas all three of those people actually spent a lot of time and effort thinking about their enemy. Um, he just wrote off President Zelensky. He had no idea that President Zelensky had within him the wherewithal to do the exact opposite of the president of Afghanistan a few months earlier, who just jumped into his helicopter with a suitcase full of, um, you know, millions of US dollars and fled the country. Well, that was not the kind of person Zelensky was. And yet an awful lot of Putin's plans um, were based on the idea that he was going to be able to take uh, Kiev in a matter of hours, if not days. Well, let's stay for one more question on a, on a question that, that continues to be related to Ukraine. Uh, you're a world history scholar. You're a political leader in, in, in Britain. From your uh, vantage point, do you believe that the United States should be more or less engaged in global conflict? And as you know, there's a debate going on about whether or not the United States should even be engaged. In Ukraine. 
Well, the good thing, I mean, the whole point of deterrence is that if you're fully engaged, you don't need to get involved in conflict. Uh, there are no American soldiers on the ground in Ukraine any more than there are in Gaza. Um, and so, you know, what is needed from the United States is its extraordinary arms capacity, the yes. uh, attackers, for example, the long range strategic missiles, which can really make a difference, uh, the Abrams tanks and so on. You have given uh, a lot already, but the um, recent counteroffensive, the autumn counteroffensive that happened in the fall and the winter of uh, last year would have been uh, much more successful had there been a proper um, uh, and huge reinforcement by the Americans and also, of course, the Europeans. The Europeans now have actually given more than the Americans, um, but uh, so they should. You know, they they have a uh, ridiculously low percentage of GDP that they they pay. They have been bumping it up. 18 out of 31 yes. of them now do pay the 2 percent. But 2 percent, frankly, is not enough in a world that is now dominated by a um, a serious threat to the international rules-based order, um, which the United States, for historical reasons, but also in its own interests, uh, needs to lead. The free world needs leadership from the United States. No one else can quite do it in the way that you can. And you were the people who set up the international rules-based order with Dumbarton Oaks and uh, Bretton Woods and the United Nations and NATO in the 1940s. And therefore, I do think that you have a profound moral responsibility to ensure that it's not just ripped up by a very, very sinister combination of Russia and China, who have publicly stated that they have no limits to their friendship, of countries like Iran and uh, North Korea that are clearly very bad actors on the world stage. And without the United States uh, playing a, f a, a, a leading role, um, I think you're, um, uh, all of these, these hard-won um, uh, achievements are, are in danger. And also, of course, the other thing is just looking to, from, a, from a purely sort of financially return on investment um, uh, attitude. Look, to pay the 60 billion that you've got um, held up in Congress at the moment is likely to actually give you some fantastic returns already. The What you have paid already, about 76 billion has won um, the extraordinary ability to for the Ukrainians, not uh, obviously American boots on the ground, but the Ukrainians, to destroy 3,000 Russian tanks. Now, if you'd ever asked a, um, I mean, it's almost their entire tank fleet that they, that they attacked with. Of course, they're rebuilding uh, and reinforcing. But if you asked any American president whether they'd have paid 60 billion um, or so to destroy every Russian tank, they would have leapt at the chance as, as especially a 60 billion out of a um, two year uh, defense budget of yours of 1.8 trillion is a very, very small uh, proportion. Yes. Well, let's switch gears and, and talk about some bigger picture questions, a couple of them. Uh, talk to us a bit about the, the differences in how war uh, was engaged during World War II and how it's uh, wage today? Well, technology, certainly, of course. In, back in 1945, when we were fighting Hitler, uh, we didn't have to worry about the space, um, outer, uh, outer space aspect, um, the cyber aspect. There was no such thing as drones. Um, the uh, discovery of AI and robotics is going to change warfare in the future in a way that Adolf Hitler, um, thankfully, had no chance of getting his hands on nuclear of course, is the, is the other uh, great aspect, although he did see that at the very end of World War II, of course, um, because that's what ended World War II. So, um, so all of these technological advances are there. Um, you don't have the same kind of fighting it with the great uh, divisions and cores in the way that you do in some occasions, like the um, Gulf War, you did yes. see that, but um, but overall, you have a lot more sort of counterinsurgency kind of struggles post 1945 that are not state on state actors necessarily, or they are by proxy, um, and they're and they're fought in every kind of uh, sort of lesser than cross border invasions. So the actually the Russian invasion of Ukraine is relatively rare in terms of of the 400 or so wars that we've seen since 1945. So yeah, every things different 
and um, and the good thing is that overall um the um the west has managed to adapt sometimes there have been really big paradigm shifting wars like Yom Kippur uh, in 1973 uh, and i i believe this russo ukrainian war is a is a real um, paradigm shifting one as well and the key thing is that the pentagon and uh, the british ministry of defense and so on must keep learning the uh, lessons of uh, of conflict fair to say that there's some serious questions about leadership from and in the united states particularly as we head into an election year we're already well into it this this will be a long long process uh, this year uh, what are some universal characteristics of leaders that have been true throughout history? Good. I'm very pleased that you haven't actually asked me to wade into your actual election struggle because as an Englishman, no, I, wouldn't do that as an Englishman I wouldn't even so much as try to tiptoe into, uh, into, that, into that mind. Very wise. If, you, if you want to uh, alienate the 50% of your listeners immediately, that's the way to go about it in, in, in quick order. But, um, but to answer your question, you need, uh, and, I, and I very much came away from these uh, books on Napoleon and Churchill thinking about this, as you can imagine. Um, you need courage. Uh, both moral and physical courage is an important aspect of, uh, of leadership. So is foresight, the capacity to actually see what results um, you're going to get from what you're doing, but also the way in which your, um, your opponent is is likely to move. That's a, that's a very important aspect of it. You should be a genuine leader. The opinion polls are uh, uh, useful, but they should not be the deciding factor on what you say and do. There's a great line of Winston Churchill's when he said that um, um, that he heard that it was very important um, to, for leaders to watch the opinion polls and keep their ears to the ground. He said that he didn't believe that the British people would um, look up to a politician caught in so ungainly a posture. And that's true as well. You know, you have to show genuine leadership. I think personal honesty is an important aspect of uh, of leadership. People have to know that they're um, that they have in their leader somebody that they uh, could admire on a on a personal level as well as uh, on a political one. Um, you've got to get the big ideas right. This is the absolute uh, key thing that's the takeaway really from our book with regard to the military leadership is that um, you can lose wars even if you start off with many more men controlling the cities, better equipment and so on. Um, if you don't have the right kind of um, big ideas about the nature of the struggle that you're engaged in. So I think that also it's true of military, but it's also true, I think, of political leadership. Um, and then finally, and you're going to say, I would say this wouldn't tie, but it's important, I think, that these um, that, that modern day leaders should have studied history or should continue to study history in the way that they do. I was tremendously impressed when I... Um, uh, learnt that uh, George um, W. Bush and Karl Rove um, had a sort of history reading competition when uh, when Bush was in the in the White House, and uh, I had a chance to actually sort of see this for myself back in two thousand and seven. And it's true, he, he he was a man who was very very uh, interested in, and I think affected by the um, the study of the past. And I think that's another important thing. I I don't know whether President Biden and President Trump. Um, ever read history books, but they certainly should. A couple more questions, uh, and, and we've got a little bit of time, as I said, for just a couple more. But let talk to uh, talk to us about your service in the House of Lords. Oh, well, it's a great pleasure. I think it's just very exciting and fun. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yes, it is. I mean, mentioning earlier about history, the, the, the building, every brick of it just exudes history. As you can imagine, you know it's uh, um, yes. It, it goes back to originally. It goes back to the 12th century, but the uh, the modern building uh, came about after the uh, destruction of a fire of most of the Palace of Westminster in 1834. So you have this gorgeous fusion um, Gothic architecture with the most wonderful paintings, and uh, the, the chamber itself has this hundred foot ceiling, which. Um, I worry it would be a, a problem with regard to acoustics, but it isn't at all because of the way that the microphones work. And uh, this gorgeous golden throne that you see on the state opening of, of Parliament and uh, 
the uh, doorkeepers are dressed in white tie and uh, and look magnificent. They're usually ex ex military or ex police, and they're splendid um, uh, fellows and and ladies. You so there's the, all the panoply and the pomp and everything and the circumstance of it, but also you have these experts, top experts in their fields. We had a debate on Ukraine quite recently. We had a former chief of the defense staff, a former chief of the general staff, the head of MI6 and MI5, um, ex-heads um, and GCHQ, all were speaking you know, to try to get a sort of conference with all of those kinds of levels of, of people. A former uh, first sea lord also spoke in that and uh, foreign secretaries and chancellor of the exchequer and so on. They each put their own point of view from their own expertise and you just think there's nowhere else in the world that I could get the nowhere else in Britain at least that I could I could get that kind of level of knowledge and expertise very often also of eloquence um, in in debating the great issues of the day so so um, I'm I'm pretty much in heaven there I, I speak about <laughs> once a month there um, it can be a bully pulpit. Um, we had a debate on on Gaza recently, and the speech that I gave, they only because there were so many speakers, we were only allowed sixty seconds each. But nonetheless, my sixty second speech has now been downloaded five hundred and seventy five thousand times. Wow! You know, to have half a million, over half a million people listen to a, a you know important point that you're trying to say is frankly not something that I could get. Maybe this podcast, uh, Rick, but um, not but not. <laughs> we'll try, um, but... Thank you. It's good. It's good to be, but not um, uh, not something that you'd normally be able to get in British politics. Yes. And the House of Lords can yes. can provide you with that bully pulpit. Fascinating. Well, oh, and also, sorry, the other thing is, of course, the people there, as well as yes. these great experts and serious, uh, substantial figures. You also, uh, I don't know how much longer this is going to last should the Labour Party win the next election. You have the hereditary element of the House of Lords, who, because they um, are only there because of who their fathers and grandfathers, yes. in some cases, their great, 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 great grandfathers <laughs> were, they um, put in much more effort, in fact, than the um, life peers, such as um, such as me, they are the people who are on the front benches. Very often, they're the people who have um, a um, much proportionately much larger place in the select committees and the uh, and all the important committee work that gets done. You know, so so you you are. Uh, rubbing shoulders with the Duke of Wellington or the Duke of uh, Somerset or whoever, you know, the Earl of Leicester, whose families are part and parcel of British history. So you can imagine, for me, that's a very exciting aspect of it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Last question. You have a podcast. It's called Secrets of Statecraft, which explores the effect that the study of, of that history has had on public figures, including historians. And the title is taken from Churchill's reply to a young American who asked for some life advice. And Churchill replied, study history for therein lie all the secrets of statecraft. So let's turn the table a little bit, Andrew, and ask the question of you. What impact has the study of history had on you? It's completely changed my life. Completely changed my life. Um, I can't... Um, remember a time when history hasn't been important to me so uh it has my, my father read history at oxford we we talked about history when i was uh, growing up you know he'd take me around um castles and so on and battlefields and so uh so my my late father was a uh, tremendous influence as you can imagine but so were certain teachers there's a man called christopher perry at my prep school who was a truly inspirational uh, history teacher and so so all of my life it's been an important um, uh, part. But at Cambridge in particular, when I went to uh, Cambridge University, the intellectual stimulation I got there from my from my dons, uh, including famous ones like Norman Stone and and Morris Cowling, were um, really life life changing. You know, they it's, they made me recognise that history is a um, essential part, as Churchill was saying, in learning about the world. And it's uh, it's what turned me into a conservative as well, the, uh, the study of history. Um, there's a sort of pessimistic 
um, aspect to conservatism about the way in which human nature doesn't really change, but also a very optimistic one, because it's when you look at the past that you see how human beings have again and again um, got over through through the invention of technology or through uh, different uh, parts of um, the ingenious uh, human um, condition and um, got over the problems uh, that they've that they faced and so i'm a rational optimist because of um history and i'm also an atlanticist because of history one of the reasons i love america is because i know that together the english-speaking peoples including of course the canadians and um, new zealanders and australians and so on have been able to um to carry the torch of freedom forward so that's also history has also made me an atlanticist my wife would say that it's also made me the most terrible pedant uh because she won't go and watch history movies with me uh at all you know the, the recent napoleon movie that had so many factual errors in it all, all i do is i sort of sit there and go tusk tusk and complaining <laughs> endlessly about that so um so there are downsides as well as upsides uh rick but overall <laughs> overall like i would say that the upsides have uh, far far outweighed the downside very well said lord andrew roberts thanks so much for your incredible contributions to a free society uh, it is always just a great pleasure to spend some time with you. If I can, if I can just add also um, how proud I am to be a Bradley Prize winner and um, how proud I am also to be connected to an organization which has done so much for, for freedom and liberty in America and because of America throughout the world. Thank you very much. And as always, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of Voices of Freedom. Join us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts for our next conversation on issues impacting our freedom and America's foundational principles. And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I'm Rick Graber, and this is the Bradley Foundation Podcast.